Well, thanks for joining us for today's webinar titled Data Visualization and Analysis Tools Whiteboard Session with Wayne Eckerson. Uh, I'm Doug Cogswell. I'll be the host and key presenter. I'm the president and CEO of Advisor Solutions. Spent roughly 15 years in the business intelligence sector and have extensive client strategy and consulting experience from prior lives. Wayne Eckerson uh, will be joining us via uh, whiteboard telecast. Uh, he's a BI leader and consultant with Tech Target, 20 years in systems and BI research, and one of the known thought leaders in the business intelligence space. This agenda came about, Wayne and I were talking about how to create a topology or a framework for sorting out what visualization does and the, the different kinds of options out there, because this is one where everything's not the same. There's some solutions that are, are focused on display and reporting. They're fairly static. Uh, there's others that are more aimed at exploration. And then there's a set of uh, tools out there that are focused on data discovery and analysis. And the challenge is often these all get locked in the same bucket uh, from marketing perspectives and some of the articles out there. So we thought it'd be uh, enlightening to try to create a framework to sort some of this out and uh, add some clarity to the differences. So we'll go through that, and then we're going to talk about who leads where. We'll tile in some of the vendors. We'll look at what really matters and then go through some use cases. This webinar will last 30 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A. It is being recorded and will be available for viewing later, and the uh, PowerPoint materials here will be available as well. So let's jump right in, and we're going to uh, uh, play uh, Wayne's webinar, which was recorded. Um, it was recorded about a month ago, and it's a really good insight into uh, leading thinking uh, in this area. Hi, this is Wayne Eckerson, Director of Research at Tech Target, here today to talk to you about data visualization tools. A data visualization tools are very popular today, and that's because they offer many benefits. As all of you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. The same is true with the data visualization tool. So the primary benefit of these tools is that it enables users to spot trends and outliers at a glance using a variety of different chart types, pies, bars, lines, more sophisticated uh, elements like maps and uh, scatter plots, uh, so that users can see uh, exactly what's in the data, in fact, large volumes of data, without having to scroll through all the details. The second major benefit is that it provides speed of thought uh, analysis. Most of these tools are built on in-memory databases uh, where the data is downloaded into memory and allows users to ask questions, get answers, and then ask new questions at the speed of thought. So really conducive to iterative types of analysis. And the final benefit of data visualization tools, at least most of them, is that it allows analysts to publish their findings to all the other users. Uh, on a server so they can take what they've found, kind of clean it up, sanitize it, push it to a server, and provide access to the users they want. So those are the three benefits of data visualization tools. There are many others, but these are the primary ones. You know, spot trends and outliers by speed of thought processing and analysis and the ability to publish analysis to a server. So there are some things to consider when implementing data visualization tools. The first is that these tools work best when running against prepared data. And by prepared data, I mean data from a warehouse or data mart where the data has been sanitized, cleansed, and integrated. It's not to say that data visualization tools can't run against other types of data, uh, but it's a lot easier uh, if they run against prepared data. The second is that a lot of these tools at least started their life as desktop tools. That's because most of them were designed for power users or analysts who prefer to work with a desktop application in most cases where they can download the data. It gives them more flexibility uh, to do the kinds of analysis that they want to do. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a desktop tool, but if you want to scale it to the enterprise and give access to many more people uh, to these tools and their output, then you have to make sure that the tool also has a robust server. And finally, not all data visualization tools are created equally. Uh, the many different types and variations. Now, this chart helps to understand the variations among data visualization tools. Let me explain the axes first. On the y-axis uh, is a dimension that goes from reporting to analysis. And by reporting here, I mean views of data or content that are more static 
the interactive, uh, where you're looking at metrics that are predefined and dimensions that are predefined uh, more than ad hoc, uh, and that functions or calculations that are more simple in nature uh, than more complex. It's not to say that reports can't be interactive and uh, support very complex functionality, which some do. But in a visualization world, uh, this is what I'm talking about. Some of the more simpler visualization tools offer more static, predefined uh, views with simpler calculations. On the other hand, the more complex or advanced visualization tools will offer higher degrees of interactivity, uh, greater degrees of exploration, and support more complex functions, including data mining functions. On the x-axis, I'm talking about data complexity. And here, the primary difference between a, you know, an environment that has low data complexity or high is the degree to which the data is prepared and sanitized uh, and integrated, as I said earlier. So those are our two axes. Now we can start plotting categories of data visualization tools. Uh, the first category is what I would call display type visualization tools. And these are what I would say are very simple dashboards uh, that provide one or two layers of, of data um, that do allow uh, objects on the screen to uh, synchronize with each other, update each other. So if you change one, the others on the screen are automatically updated as well but simple dashboards for the most part with a highly visual interface that can be very appealing to users. The next category of data visualization tools what I would call exploratory data visualization tools that are really conducive to allowing analysts to go source any data they want from any place or any system they want, uh, pull it down, and then start exploring that data uh, by turning any metric or dimension into a filter find multiple filters at once, uh, blending some of these uh, data assets together, uh, creating some simple hierarchies, uh, and, and doing some degree of analysis. Uh, the third category of data visualization tools, what I would call a reporting-based visualization tool, kind of a misnomer. What I'm really saying here is a much more interactive, uh, scalable uh, dashboard environment uh, that allows uh, a whole department or even a whole enterprise to interact with the data at a much higher level than with a simple display dashboard. And the final category of data visualization tools is what I would call an analytical data visualization tool that incorporates more advanced uh, analytical functions, including regressions uh, and uh, various other types of data mining functions that users can apply to subgroups or custom groups that they've created in the tool. Uh, to do more richer analysis. So those are the four categories of uh, data visualization tools. The interesting thing is that no one tool on the market, if you map it to these categories, is going to fall neatly within one of these four categories. Instead, most of them kind of fall heavily on one and then blend some of the effects and capabilities of the other. So an exploration tool, for instance, will be heavy on exploration capabilities, but also provide a certain degree of analysis and reporting and even display capabilities. Whereas a reporting tool will be heavy on the development environment for an enterprise scalable environment, but also allow analysts to do some exploration, as well as apply some more complex uh, functions if required. And finally, the analysis tools will obviously be heavy on the analysis, complex uh, functionality, but also enable uh, their power users to, to explore the data, as well as prepare dashboards for others to so my name is Wayne Eckerson. Uh, that's what you need to know about data visualization tools. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Have a great day. So Wayne laid out a great framework for looking at this. And just to summarize, at the beginning, he talked about the intersection of data visualization and in-memory in data storage. The two go together because the in-memory gives the kind of speed of thought capability uh, to querying and slicing the data that the visualization then needs to show. He talked about three benefits, seeing trends in data, speed of thought analysis, sharing insights. We'll talk about that uh, over the next few minutes. And some considerations. It works best against prepared data, although you'll see it also can work really well with unprepared data, but you know, clearly um, prepared data is easier. They've been desktop tools, but they're moving more and more to the web and tablet for distribution of insights. 
and there's many variations. In fact, Wayne's framework, I think, did a great job of laying out uh, the uh, industry. Um, we, Advisor Solutions, is in the data discovery and analysis quadrant. We uh, can load one simple Excel table. Uh, we will often load 130 source tables from an Oracle warehouse. Uh, we have the ability to link and join tables, roll tables up, do some ETL. We also have a set of charts that are more statistical oriented and more analytic oriented than the lower left corner. And we've embedded predictive modeling. You'll see that because we're going to talk about the, the top right segment in the next few minutes. Reporting area, a great example of this would be ClickTech. They've got a strong in-memory back end. But their visualization and their display is really focused on showing information with some degree of interaction, but not the focus on really doing detailed analysis, uh, slicing and dicing data into uh, quadrants and providing predictive analytics and the kinds of things a data discovery and analysis tool would be. A great example of an exploration tool would be Tableau. Uh, they um, work really well with prepared data. They've got strong visualization, but uh, aren't as strong at bringing uh, the set of source tables into memory that would be useful for a full reporting tool or a full-fledged uh, data discovery and analysis tool. Not all the statistical charts and don't have the predictive analytics. So those are kind of, we and they are kind of three leaders in this space. We cover different quadrants. The challenge is often in the marketing messages, everything gets all mixed up and put in one bucket. But you know, we are clearly solving different kinds of problems. And there's more on this. If you're interested, this will come back up at the end. There's a report, visual reporting and analysis, seeing is knowing, that was done by Wayne about a year and a half ago. And it's available from our website for free. Uh, you can go to our home page and pick it up. Again, you'll see this at the end. So data discovery and analysis, uh, I'm going to focus the rest of this on that top right quadrant, which is what we do. The concept is you load data. An end user does some discovery exploration in it gets insights, they see stories, they come to decisions, and then they deliver results out. It could be that they deliver results out as visual charts and PowerPoints. It could be that they deliver results out as a list of 40,000 customers they now want to send to a campaign engine and, and send a mailing out to. There's additional chart types over the, the display and the reporting kinds of charts, charts that are more statistical. And there's a lot of flexibility with data, because in data discovery and analysis, it's more ad hoc. Uh, so we can load prepared and also unprepared data. One Excel spreadsheet, 130 source system tables from an Oracle warehouse. Multiple tables from multiple sources, multiple kinds of relationships, one to one, one to many, many to many. Much of this data cannot easily, or it can be flattened, but you then lose a lot of the power of retaining the original multiple uh, one to many, many to many relationships. Link, copy, roll up so the data can be connected in the in-memory pool. Uh, tables can be transformed to rolled up tables. Uh, there's interaction across all for both uh, charts and pages. We like to say you can select anywhere and it updates everywhere. You'll see that in our upcoming uh, demo. And in-memory uh, gives you the speed that you need for, in, uh, for, for this uh, speed of thought analysis. If you're transversing a network to a database, asking a database to do work, it's a lot slower than if the data is physically resident right there where the app is running. Also, new field calculations, numeric, string, uh, date, and conditional are part of these tools. And the concept is you're setting this up for visual discovery. So people can visually explore things. The human mind can see patterns, can drill down, can ask new questions. Included with this is predictive modeling. The, the idea here is a human mind can look at 5, 10, 15 fields and start figuring out what's going on by visually exploring data. But much of this data is 50, 100, in some of our cases it's four or 500 fields wide. The human mind can't visually untangle that, so we add some predictive modeling, which determines mathematically what the five key fields are and the buckets within it. You'll see that in a few minutes. But this is the concept of a, a visual tool aimed at display and analysis, discovering analysis versus display or reporting. And if you look at going on beyond reporting, I love this chart. This guy, Norman, comes into the room with this collection of you know, reports and charts and things. And the group, Norman, just tell us, are we doing good or are we doing bad? And there's three things going on here. First, the people in the room can't see the story. They see a bunch of charts and numbers. There's, second is there's way too many moving parts to easily untangle it. And the third thing is, in this model, you're relying on Norman. There's a bottleneck. There's one person here who prepares and tries to interpret the data, yet you have a group of managers trying to understand it. And at a high level, this is what 
visualization is about. It's taking that kind of data and making it easy to see and to interact with. And I love this quote from one of our customers. The combination of data discovery and visualization enables our users to uncover hidden relationships that they did not know existed. I'll often hear, why didn't we have this data before? In fact, they did have it in a report. They should, just didn't see it. And so that's the key to visualization, is getting the human mind to see and understand and create insights so they can make better decisions. So in the data discovery and analysis tool, there's a range of chart types. We happen to have 15. I think the important points here are there are charts that are more uh, sort of report-like, data sheets, counts, uh, text filters, uh, basically rows and columns. In any, we find in any good visual display, you need charts, but you also need some stats and you need some, if it's customers, customer names, if it's products, product names, because people need that to get context. And so we tend to balance these more standard charts with um, more visual charts, bar charts, pie charts. We also have a set of richer charts you'll see in a few minutes, uh, heat maps, para boxes, timetables, which are more aimed at analysis. And in fact, I'm going to do a demonstration right now of a project that uses the, the timetable. So let me just click this. I'm opening a web uh, visualization project. And we're looking at uh, event logs from a factory floor in a manufacturing operation. It's one day of event logs. There's 88. 1,203. There's a list of them all here. There's you know, a chart which groups them by command. I can sort alphabetically. I can sort by count. I can sort of start getting a feel for what's going on here. But it's really hard to explain to management or to see problems in this. So there's a chart called the timetable, which is a very visual view of this, which people can start seeing the stories. So it's the same, same data as on the first page, but it's grouped into 30 categories. And then across the horizontal, we're looking at transactions at the second level across the day. So for example, this collect firmware revision, each of these ticks is an event. Uh, they happen early in the day, then there's none the rest of the day. This execute command happens pretty regularly through the day. And here, it's a little hard to see maybe on the, the go to meeting, but there's long tails here, so they last longer duration. And this bar on the right is totaling the events across the day for each of these command groups, and this dominates. You see there's other unusual patterns, like this user prompt is not doing anything, that it comes on with some long intervals and goes silent and comes back again. So somebody who knows manufacturing data can look at this, and there are some unusual patterns. We've, in fact, coded them by fault levels, major fault A, major fault B, and no fault. Let me just do some visual discovery. I select the two fault types. The chart on the left colors only those fault types now. So I see major fault A occurs only in the user prompt and for this duration here. This might be hard to see in the webinar, but there's a couple of short spikes out here of the same user fault. The blue one, major fault B, happens only in the execute command and it happens uh, in sort of late morning and then again in the afternoon in this gap period when everything else has gone silent. I might say I want to just drill in on the user prompt. Let me grab that one. I go back to the first page. And my detail has changed to show my 32 event logs that were in that fault category. And there's a list of them all. I might want to export these out of the uh, data discovery and analysis tool down on my desktop uh, and take action on it and uh, you know, give it to the operator, say there's a problem with the user prompt in this area. What happened? This is a great example of how a visualization tool can help untangle a complex set of data and make it easy for human beings to understand what's going on and focus in and take action. There's a set of other problems like this. For example, healthcare claims fits the same pattern. Email marketing campaigns, you can picture the, the rows could be themes. Um, systems data, we do a lot of work in that area with system intrusion and security data. So there's a set of problems that are time-based. You're trying to see patterns. If you threw this in text, it's hard. You threw this in a lot of line charts, it can be overwhelming. A chart like this displays it really well. So what we saw here is the visualization surfaced the patterns. It consolidated what would have been a lot of reports that Norman would have come into the room with. It leaves impressions in people's heads. We find in many of our clients, instead of Norman, there's a projector with um, the data discovery tool on the screen and people are having the discussion off the visualization and can navigate, drill in, see the problem areas in context of the whole uh, situation. 
and it leads to better and faster decision making. Wayne's second benefit of visualization was speed of thought. And we see this a lot, whether it's a meeting in person or phone call with some, you know, go to meeting or WebEx. Data is on the screen. People are trying to slice it different ways and not necessarily sure where they want to go with it. So they need to have it much more ad hoc than a report. And we would say, and we see in many of our clients, that that more collaborative speed of thought approach eliminates the cycle of pain, which the other way to get that, in, that information is the user makes a custom report request. It goes to back to IT, a query is run, some result comes back, it takes a few days. You didn't get the answer you thought, it goes back through the cycle. The other version is download from the source systems into Excel, uh, get some flattened data, try to slice and dice it there. It's hard because it's hard to go through a lot of fields. You don't have all the data, hard to show people, and then the Excel sheet lives on because it's hard to get in the first place, so you keep it. There's a whole set of problems we've seen visualization applied to are about list reduction. And that could be, I've got 20 million customers. I want to find the right list of 40,000 to send a mailing to. That's perfect for this. Uh, I'm an HR manager. I want to find the at-risk employees in my firm. I don't know. I've got 300,000 employees. I, I don't know how many there are, but I want to get a list of them out. Or in this case, we're going to be a fundraiser. And we're, our president is going to South Florida. We want to find the right people uh, to invite to a dinner. So let's take a look at what that might go like. So I'm opening another advisor project. And again, we're web bases can work in browsers, can work in iPads, uh, can work in client PCs, as Wayne said as well. So the idea here is uh, we have a project that's been set around this data. There's 93,000 prospects. There's a list of them all. There's some filters on the first page. We organize projects into themes based on pages. So there's a page on ratings. There's a map. There's giving history. There's different pages that are different themes about the people. And each page will have charts tiled on it that help um, illustrate that particular theme. And as we said before, you can select anywhere, and it updates everywhere. So. Let's do a little brainstorming for our dinner. South Florida, we want high-rated prospects who maybe haven't been staffed. We go to the ratings page. Here's the data on them. It's the same 93,000 people, the same list summarized. There's a bar chart which shows ratings. So these people are rated highest is red and one, 166 of them. Uh, two rated, there's 281. So I might say, let's just grab the three highest ratings. I sweep over them with the mouse. My counts change. There's 953 of them. Here's the staffing levels. This bar at the top are the ones who aren't staffed. It tells me I have 224, the lower number, unstaffed in those top rating groups out of 81,000 total unstaffed. That's actually not enough. So I'm going to go back and say, I cut this the wrong way. Let's add in this next rating group, the 1 to 5 million group. So I control click add it in. Um, now I've got 3,000 total people. I have 711 in this unstaffed group, that's better. Let's get rid of everybody else. So now I'm just looking at my top rating groups. I can zoom the bar in because at this level, uh, I actually want to see all the labels at the top of this group. So I'm seeing a bunch of these are staffed. The unstaffed are this uh, 711. I'm using coloring consistently. So I see I've got a mix of red and orange. I have uh, sort of across the ratings here, I've got some of the red, highest, yellow. Okay, so I have a mix. Let's grab this group, get rid of everybody else. And so there's the 711. Let's go to the map page and see where they live. Well, there's a big bar up here in New York. So I've got a cluster in New York, 85 up there. I've got some in Boston, uh, 10, some in the suburbs around. Uh, not a whole lot in Chicago. looks like I have a cluster in the Bay Area, not a lot in LA. And I actually have a lot in South Florida. So we, we might actually want to go back and do some dinners up here. But uh, doing South Florida, I sweep over them with the mouse. I've selected them. I can go back uh, now to my uh, ratings page and see what this looks like, get rid of the rest of the group. I'm down to 59. Here's a list. I see there's some large donors in here, some smaller donors. Maybe I want to go to the giving history page. This is a last cut. Uh, and sort of see what the patterns have been. I'm drilling down on them. Uh, here's the list. Dean Peckham, I click on him. I see, wow, he's given half a million dollars, but it was back in 2005 and nothing since. OK, I'm getting my profile for him. Let's pick another one. Um, Ivy Kumar. Well, Ivy 
she's given 108,000, but it's been building recently. So this is a really good story. So I have a couple of different stories I'm emerging as I prep for my dinner. I can go back to my first page to 59 people, go down to the bottom, export this out to my desktop, and I have my list, you know, for my event planner. That's a good example of this whole concept of eliminating the cycle of pain and getting uh, an answer in, you know, 10 minutes instead of uh, several weeks. And in that example, the query we started with, the three highest rating, rated categories, wasn't yielding enough. So we had to go back and add a category. And we wanted to see how that category fit against the other categories. And we did this without help from IT or outside resources, no cycle of pain, got a clear action plan and with a collaborative team effort. That's another uh, way these visualization tools are used. And the last one, as we finish up here, I want to look at uh, more quantitative analysis. So we're going to look at some statistical charts and some predictive modeling and really drill in on some data. And this is really good for looking at outliers and portfolios. So let's bring up uh, another project, um, which I have open here. This is mutual fund data. Uh, so this is a, a five-page project. We're looking at roughly 1,800 mutual funds. This scatter plot uh, lays them out from on the lower left is low three-year performance, minus 27%. The right is high, 43%. The vertical axis is, axis is volatility or risk from 0.1 to 8.3. Each of these dots is a fund. I mouse over it. It tells me some stats about the fund right there on the, the scatter plot. It shows me in the bar chart on the left which category it's in. And if you look at this sheet at the bottom, which is a list of all the funds and some stats, when I put the mouse on one, it shows up here. So if I go to this blue one, I'm seeing it at three places with different degrees of detail. I've grouped them into these fund categories by the amount of invested, and I've colored that way. We use color consistently. So you start getting analytic insights right away just by a layout with use of color. The balance funds are blue. They're clustered in this group right along here, fairly tight uh, range of performance and risk. I'm seeing these oranges uh, kind of fairly tight in performance, but range widely in risk. They're the small caps. I can click the small caps. I'll see the selection there. I can click the uh, balance and see where they are. So I've linked these charts and the, the coloring and so forth lets me really understand it. Now I want to go a little bit deeper. What are these funds in the top right quadrant, which are the ones with high return and high risk? I select them. The list at the bottom changes. I'm now seeing the selection percent. So for analysis, you don't want to filter that group. You want to select that group and see it compared to everything else. And I'm seeing the small cap, the red, is that selection, the top of the bar is everything. 75% of my small cap are in that top quadrant, heavily skewed that way. I'm seeing the green, the growth has more dollars invested there, but as a percentage of all the growth funds, it's a little bit less. I can change this chart sort order now, because I'm really interested in the concentrations, change the display order to by percent. There's different ways I can order it. Let's go to percent selected. It throws the ones that are more skewed towards that corner quadrant at the top, small cap, see the stat, 76%. Growth, 60%. Capital appreciation, 49%. So I'm starting to get some quantitative analysis of the concentration in that top right corner. Let's look at asset allocation, the next page. Different view, same data. The pie chart actually visually shows the concentrations in another way. And, and that's important because people respond differently to different types of visualizations. Uh, so I see here, I mean, the concentration of small cap, it's the same thing, 75% followed by growth, followed by capital appreciation. There's virtually nothing in these other, uh, these other groups. I've got the stats here. Another view of this is the heat map view. So in this, uh, what I've colored in are the funds I've selected. Let's bring everything back for a second. So what the heat map is doing is taking all of my 1,800 funds and grouping them into the categories, growth, international, balanced, small cap, and so forth. So this top left thing, the box is the Fidelity Magellan Fund. This is old data. It's stating the three-year performance is 22%, which is good. It's green. Uh, the scale goes from 43 is dark green to minus 26 is bright red. It's big because of big invested position. This gives me an at-a-glance view of what's happening in this portfolio. I see the growth is generally doing fine. The international is balanced, is very varied. It's got one that's doing really well, a small one, one that's doing really bad. In general, it's a hotter color, so it's doing less well. Mortgage and, tre and treasuries are more middle of the road performance, but very consistent. You know, the capital appreciation has a couple of extreme outliers. 
let's go back to our selection. So this is that top right quadrant again. This is another way of quickly getting across where my concentration is in my portfolio. It's heavily skewed towards three fund categories, the growth, the small cap of capital appreciation, not much anywhere else, especially when you look at the invested positions. So I'm finishing up. I might want to take this page and say, I really like this. I want to give it to my team. So I go to the task view, export the page. We saw how to export data a few minutes ago. Let's export the chart. Send this to a PowerPoint, put it on my desktop. So now I've got the chart uh, out of advisor into PowerPoint. And it's, you know, it's a form where I can, these are all editable, they're just PowerPoint objects. I can take it to my team and say, here's my top right quadrant, what I'm excited about, and here's, I can see the concentrations right there. Back to the project for a second. So I've sort of um, pretty much done as much as I can do visually. Let's run a predictive model now to go deeper in the analysis. I go to the task view, build a predictive model. And this is something really unique about an integrated in-memory visualization modeling tool. Because um, I have all the data, I know what my selection state is, so I create a model. I call it top right quadrant. I've got only one table in this. It's a simple data set. I can do a regression model against any of the numeric fields in this table that it loaded in, or I could do a classification model. I, I want to do one of those. That classification model is going to take this group of selected funds and do a regression against the entire population, which is everything else. I need to take off the, the I selected on uh, performance and risk, so I probably want to get them off, but it'll tell me my group is explained by performance and risk. Uh, volatility, risk, I think beta is the same type of field. So I click OK. This is running a test model and then about 25 models behind the scenes and it's picking the one that's the best fit. So it's a very rich set of regression algorithms that just ran. It told me I have enough fields to be explanatory and that I have enough rows and to be predictive if I want to score others for their potential to be in this quadrant. It tells me, it tells me that fund category explains 52%. So what we saw visually, we see here. The one that's the highest aligned is small cap. It's basically figured out this correlation. The next one is the capital appreciation. It's the next strongest affiliation, which is this one. And then some of these and the ones balanced mortgage are the least, they're actually a negative correlation with being there. So that, that makes sense. There's some other fields. Uh, for example, um, look down the list here, return since inception. Whoops, that's another return. Let's edit that out. We just saw we made a mistake when we ran the model. Very easy to do this. I just uncheck it. It's no longer an explanatory field. I rebuild the model, so the weight's going to be taken off that field. Um, so now I can sort of scan the other ones here and kind of get a feel for what makes up this, this performance. But this is an example of a great way to do visual discovery and then combine it with quantitative modeling to get a feel for the overall uh, mix of a portfolio. I now can hit predict. It'll run the model against the rest of the fields to put two more uh, fields in the table. It put a field for predicted and a score, so I could go and look at which of these other um, funds have the same characteristics that would be predicted to have the same behavior. Obviously, this kind of capability can be used in a whole wide range of areas, from uh, impact on sales results to you know, impact on giving to impacts of breakdown in a factory floor flow process to yields on mailings and so forth. So uh, a, the mind can really probably envision a lot of things here. The last thing on this demo, we want to look at an advanced correlation page. So this is a very statistical chart uh, that's great for analysis. This is the same funds. Uh, we've taken the, the categories and their size by how big they are, colored the same way, the fund name, and then the performance, 26 week, one year, three year, five year, 10 year. So this is an increase across time of performance, net assets. These are a bunch of numeric measures. I'm just going to do a selection at the top of this one to show you. I just selected. Um, so these are box plots. This is the gray is all the data. This is the median, the number above of 10-year performance, 10.8%. This is the 25th to 75th distribution. This is the 5th to 95th percentage of the whole data. I just grabbed the top 5% of the 10-year performers. There's about 20 funds in that. I can now see these lines are each of the funds. Uh, this, is, this orange line is one fund. This green line is another fund. Well, they're generally pretty good in five-year generally above the, all above the median on three years as well, but some of them are pretty bad on 26 week in, 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 in one year, in fact, these two. So let's intersect and grab those two funds 
And I've got two funds that are really bad starting up but get really good. And I see that you know I've got high above average. So I've untangled very complex, multi-dimensional quantitative data and can see the patterns across the different fields. It's linked again. I can go back to the first page. Here are the two funds, one capital appreciation, one uh, small cap. I can sort of see where they fit in my overall risk and return. So to summarize here, back to the PowerPoint. Uh, I've got to go back to where it was in the PowerPoint. And um, so when we do this work, and we went through three examples, we're looking for clean design. We want pages that are not too dense, not too sparse. We balance graphics and text. We use the charts in different ways that are appropriate. It's not just a bunch of graphs, but you actually need the identifiers and the counts. You saw that in the examples. And then this is one of Wayne's rules. Uh, you want to be able to get from summary to detail in three clicks or less as you're doing this discovery and analysis. And I think in the examples you saw, we could go from a, a portfolio of hundreds of thousands, or in, in many of our cases, it's tens of millions of things, down to the row level detail on transactions really quick. His last point was sharing insights. And I think through, uh, four things here. These things are becoming more and more visual. They're becoming more and more collaborative. And it's, it's breaking the cycle of pain. They're becoming more interactive and intuitive as people work through the data, how to score things, how to show things. And they're becoming more and more mobile, which is the ability to access interactive display of data anywhere, anytime, whether it's on a tablet or uh, you're on a browser or you're uh, on a PC or on a uh, desktop or whatever. So that's, that's the summary. Um, and um, we're open for questions at this point. So here's a question. Um, do you see data visualization deployed more for individual power users or, or departmental apps? Um, OK, good question. Um, we actually have two use cases. You know, People can buy individual seats of software and basically load up data and you know, set up charts and do ad hoc analysis. We didn't go through that today. Uh, you would set things up probably along the design of the different projects you saw. Uh, but more and more, we're finding, especially if you're working with you know, complex data sets, we'll create a project uh, that is aimed at the mutual funds or aimed at the prospect identification or aimed at the factory floor, the three examples we saw, and then push that out over the web to, it's usually these are departmental things, departmental level problems, 10, 50, 100 people, 200 people. And then they can interact with it the way I did. Uh, so the experience I showed you here was an experience that you know can be pushed out over the web to to a group. Uh, what I didn't show you was the authoring, the real ad hoc. Uh, I have a new table came in. What do I do with it? How do I figure out what's in it? But there are two distinct use cases we work with. Yes, yeah, somebody asked uh, who's behind our data visualizations. Um, what we are is a spin-off from Bell Labs here in the Chicago area. So our in-memory technology and our visualization came from 10 or 15 years of research in Bell Labs, and, and Advisor has commercialized it. So it's a rich, deep uh, technology portfolio with 20 or 25 patents on it. And you know, this is an area we are well-renowned for and clearly one of the leaders in. And, and there's in the, yeah, that's. Can we deploy to a large group of 1,000 or more on a web server? Yes, uh, but generally, especially the dis if you go back to Wayne's chart up here, uh, the number of users for discovery and analysis is going to be less than for a reporting tool or for a general display. Um, typically, analysis and discovery is done around a departmental or a problem area. And typically, we're seeing 10, 50, 100 users, 200 users, maybe. Um, we might have several of these that are then out to thousands of users. But it's rare you're going to have a discovery and analysis situation where you want to slice and dice that goes to a very wide audience. And clearly, down in this quarter, that can be the case. So I think the answer to that question depends on what type of problem and what type of solution uh, we're talking about. There's a question that came up. Are there any uh, interactivity limitations? Um, 
there's sort of a couple of embedded questions in that. Uh, one that goes with it is how much data can you put into memory? Um, yeah, so we pull from databases, Excel, whatever. In our memory pool, we can load. We're not constrained, but a big project for us would be, say, you know, 110 tables, 80 million rows, 500 fields, probably going to run 8 gigs of RAM to run something like that. If you have multiple users, they're each going to take more. So that's sort of our upper general limit, although it's a practical, not a theoretical limit. Uh, at that level, that, those numbers of tables, our response time is sub-second. If you make, for example, a selection on the transaction table, which might be 20 million transactions, and you're grabbing every transaction over 200 bucks, uh, that will link to the customer table, and it might tag the you know, 6 million customers who have done that. That would then link to the promotions table and tag the 10 promotions they got, and all that would update sub-second. So charts on a page in promotions would quickly update to see which ones drove sales over $200. Um, and that's the range we're working with. We are partners with EMC Greenplum, for example, who have massive data sets. We don't load an entire Greenplum warehouse into memory. We work with their engine to load a set of data that's reasonable for analysis. Could be we roll up a table and load. You know, we might sample a table and load uh, and so forth. But our goal, our design points are to have a project load in 10 to 40 seconds and then have, once it's loaded, to have sub-second response time on any selection, on any chart, on any page. Uh, and then that concept of select anywhere, update everywhere applies. Obviously, that can be broken. You, you could set pages so they don't link to each other, but most of our projects, uh, the selection will link across uh, uh, the pages. Um, do we use? Do do you use? Are you using control con closed loop control systems? Um, we do quite a bit of work in systems and network data, and in machine and factory floor data, uh, which is you're looking at those problems all have event logs. Uh, they, they could be called different things, but basically they're throwing out um, signals uh, at regular interviews as things happen. That, that's the first example you saw. Um, so yeah, some of those can be closed loop control systems. It can be other kinds of systems. But there's a general problem area there, which we are pretty good at. And we have a couple partners working in the space, and we, we operate directly in that space as well. How do users how do users get relationship findings from discoveries that they require? I'm not sure, I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, how do users act on relationship findings from discoveries that may require further software implementation work or require further visualization? Yeah, so in our world, let's go back, open a project up. Um, go back to one of these. Uh, well, rather than going back, but uh, let me just answer the question. So in our world, uh, you know, you do the discovery and uh, analysis, and you can do several things when you reach a selection state you're interested in. Uh, you can export the charts uh, into PowerPoint, Word, PDF, HTML, uh, as we saw in the uh, one example. You can export also the rows and columns from any of the tables in memory uh, out to, uh, can be say a CSV file, which can then be imported into anything else. So we do have you know customers who will link that through to their reporting systems. We have customers that have linked these things through to control systems. So you, like for example, you find uh, say problem flight segments and you want to pass it back to your uh, planners. Uh, you can connect that right back into the uh, the operating systems to do that. Uh, so I, I think that's the answer to the question. But we're trying to be a discovery and analysis tool that connects with the rest of the world you operate in, whether it's you know Microsoft Office to make presentations or data to another system. You know, and, and a lot of times the output will be a list of customers that goes back to a mailing system. Um, and, and maybe you know we just export the ID numbers so they're keyed in, or maybe we export the emails. Uh, what's in the export is just determined by 
what's in the base underlying data tables and what the user actually wants to export. There's reasons why you might not want to export emails. Uh, maybe you don't want the uh, user direct emailing. You want them to just get the ID so they have to go through your mail engine and use all the rules in it. In other cases, you might want to export the emails. So how we uh, interact coming out of Advisor can be many ways. Now, how does MedAdvisor differ from what was demonstrated? Uh, good question. So Advisor has several theme areas um, where we have solution templates, which we repeat sell. So one would be MedAdvisor, where we have uh, templates for clinical analysis, uh, financial analysis, claims analysis. I think it's uh, um, patient analysis. Uh, there's, a, there's a fifth one in there. And so we have a section of our website called MedAdvisor where we highlight uh, those kinds of solutions. And uh, when we go to deploy, you know, we've obviously done work there before, so we have templates that can be uh, tailored over to the data. Uh, we do this in, in fundraising, uh, higher education fundraising. We have a, a, a product solution area called Advancement Advisor. There are nine templated solutions, which uh, we have hundreds of accounts who have different versions of them. You know, they need to be tailored to the data sets. Um, some, in many of the fields, the data tables get customized, uh, cut different ways. Um, so if we load, in the fundraising area, we load one, you know, Aleutian banner uh, data set. The next one may be different. Conceptually, they're the same. We just have to map to wherever the fields are on the tables that we need to do the analysis. Uh, we also, back to Wayne's prepared versus unprepared data. Um, everybody likes prepared data if it's neatly in a warehouse. Uh, often it's not, or often some of it is, but some of it isn't. So that's how we often end up loading you know, 110, 130 tables from the uh, database. We're loading the source tables where the, they're not flat and they're not formatted. You know, To get an address into the customer table may take four tables. Uh, we're fine with that. We just load the tables and we bring them together in advisor. Actually, another question um, on the predictive modeling. Um, a couple of things there. What we have done is taken really rich regression algorithms uh, from a leading player, and we put them in a very simple interface so that you do not need to know modeling to use them. You just need to have an understanding for the data. And then that regression I ran literally ran probably 25 models behind the scene, and to pick the one picked, selected, the one with the best fit, and then display the output. The other thing we have, you know, we have all the data uh, in memory. Um, and so it's easy to make the selection visually. Uh, the modeling picks that up. Once you've, if you've then done scoring, you can look at the scored population, and it'll go back to all the other charts. So you can quickly explore the, the scored population in the map. Where are, where are the high scorers? Uh, you know, what are their ratings? Um, you know, have, are they staffed or are they unstaffed? So it's really cool to be able to take the model output and without going to another system, examine it visually across all the, the normal fields. And the third point on our predictive modeling is often, you know, you've got to say it's a table of people and you've got address and you've got some demographics. But what's not in that table is their prior purchase history or the fact that they've, you know, responded to three promotions. That's in the promotions table. Or, or they've come to six events. That's in the events table. Well, an advisor, it's really easy to create a flag in the events table. If they've been to one of these four kinds of events, give them a Y, and then copy that from the events table back to the people table, then it's available for the modeling. And that's a five-minute exercise without touching the database, uh, which then gives you these factors from all these tables to run in the model. This is an advantage of, a, as Wayne said, these lighter interactive discovery and analysis tools. If you tried to do that, and go back to, to the IT group to get the database tables changed. It's a much bigger, much bigger uh, deal. And you know, he's actually, or we've called this, it's an analytic sandbox where you can play with these things really lightly, easily. If you actually are going to do this all the time, sure, it should be in the database. But often at the beginning, you don't know. And this is a format you can uh, play with. Uh, another question. Someone still has to create the initial sandbox to be explored. This is still where IT is required, correct? Or can the user make an initial theme? Um, so the big thing there is understanding the data. Um, so an end user, 
generally is not going to be able to go and sort through the Oracle warehouse and figure out the 105 tables they need to load to get the content they need to do the analysis. Uh, it's just that that is unlikely. If, if it's two tables, sure they can figure out. And our software, like the other ones I mentioned earlier, is, is it's point and click. It's all wizard driven. It's not hard to do it once it's in the software. The challenge is what's in the data and what has to be moved around to use it. So typically in those situations uh, where it's going to a group of people and it's loading from an Oracle warehouse a lot of tables, our consultants will work with the client to get that set up. Uh, it, once it's set up, it's easy to modify it. We, we create projects kind of like Excel creates workbooks. We create projects and you can once the data is loaded once, you can easily modify the project to another purpose, and then it will load the data perfectly fine for the new purpose. Um, as a related question, in the production mode, how does it reload the data? So good question. If it's ad hoc, it's on demand. You, you just load data, and it pops in. Usually in production mode, we set up so we load daily. Uh, it can load more often. It can load on an event. But typically, you know, we're sitting on a file server somewhere with a master copy of a project. You saw three projects in the demo. Some, we, we kick off a trigger at, say, 3 in the morning. It goes and loads the 105 Oracle tables, builds an advisor project, embeds and encrypts the data, and then it puts it on the file server. And then the users come in either with clients or on the web or the iPad version. The, the software is loading that pre-built project into memory wherever it's running, and then the users get it. Uh, and there's two good reasons to do that. One is we're not hitting on the database during the day unless people want us to. Uh, we're only touching it once a day. Um, two is the data stays stable for the day. Typically, people don't want to be examining it at 9 in the morning, going to their boss at noon, and the data's changed. Uh, so obviously, we, we can load on demand. But most cases, uh, we load in, in that mode. There's another question about the iPad. When you run on an iPad, what actually is running on the iPad is the gist of the question. Uh, the answer is not much, uh, which is the same with our browser base. The, we have a multi-threaded uh, Windows server app that if you're running it, the data runs on a Windows server somewhere. And then basically, the iPad or browsers are interfaces to it. We're shipping images to it. Uh, and then we're picking up the interaction locally, and we're maintaining multiple sessions on the server. So if there's 50 users, they're all having different experiences. But there's the, the client and the iPad is thin. All it's doing is showing things and giving people interaction. And um, we're shipping images because it's much lighter with the volume sets than if we ship, gra ship graph definitions or, or you know, points to plot. Um, we're open to that, but right now uh, we're a very efficient uh, interaction, fast. Well, you saw the demos. Um, it's very fast delivery. It looks client-like. It's so smooth, uh, and it's completely thin. Got another question. Are the tables related to one project, or can the data tables be shared between different projects? E yeah, they can be shared. So the model there to think of is Excel again. So you create a workbook, which loads data from somewhere, uh, and then you have it. Uh, if you uh, want a, another project, uh, you would then modify that to another workbook, which would use the same data, but it's going to show it in a different way, purpose it differently. Uh, I'd say our projects, when we build a second one, um, the data isn't typically 100% the same as the first one. Um, it's, you know, if you go back to the, the fundraising example we showed, that was for finding prospects. If you now want to look at the, the mailing campaigns, the email campaigns, some of that prospect data you don't need, but you then need all the mail sends and all the email sends. So you typically are swapping around a few tables. But in general, a lot of the data is shared in something like that. And, uh, you would just create a, another project, and so you don't have to. All the schema and all the load for it would be identical. Our load time too on these projects is pretty quick. Like these these projects we've been talking about generally load in, you know, 10, 20 minutes at night. Um, depends on the speed of the database, but usually there's not much load on it uh, at that time of the day. And so the the load time we're actually on the database and off is quick. 
And then the user experience, again, is you know, 10 to 40 seconds, typically, to load one of our projects and be up and running. Well, you saw, again, several examples in the demo. Those were I don't know, 10, 15-second loads. What else do we have for questions? Uh, what data sources do we connect to? Uh, we, we connect to most common databases, um, as well as Excel Access, text files, salesforce.com, and whatnot. Um, we have some clients who have older databases or sort of proprietary databases, and in those cases, uh, we are generally loading text files that are exported from them. So there's a whole host of other cases uh, where we would load that way. Uh, other questions? I see we're also bumping up against our hour. I would, we have, if another question comes in uh, in a minute, we'll get it. But uh, just in, in closing, I'd like to go back uh, and just sort of summarize Wayne's points that, you know, there are uh, different categories of these visualization tools. They don't all do the same thing. We happen to be focused on data analysis and discovery. We talked about a, you know, a great reporting-based visualization tool was ClickTech uh, Exploration. You know, Tableau does that really well. But we're generally uh, in different realms, and uh, hopefully you've got a good sense of what we all do and the importance of getting data in a way that the human mind can see the stories in it and interact with it. And uh, you've also gotten to appreciate a little bit more about what we do, which is the sort of analytic focus of untangling problems and helping people really navigate through data richly and, and quickly. And um, we just uh, also would recommend uh, the additional report, Visual Reporting and Analysis, Seeing is Knowing, which is available from our website. It kind of goes a little bit deeper and, and does go into some of the uh, technology players a little bit more than, than it certainly I, I felt at liberty to, to do today. So uh, this has been recorded. We will be following up. Uh, we are open to questions, and uh, you know, feel free to connect back with us at any time. Uh, thank you for the time today. I appreciate it, and uh, uh, have a good rest of the day.